Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me start. Hi. Good evening. Okay, perfect, perfect. Apologies for that uh, echo earlier on. Um, let me take uh, this opportunity to welcome everybody who's joining us to this um, uh, presentation. Um, a, a presentation which I think is very important because it, it helps us um, on our journey to improving uh, as well as in whatever projects that we are working on. Um, ordinarily, what we would have done is asked everybody, gone around, greeted everybody to say, tell us what you're currently working on. But uh, time does not permit, so what uh, I will just extend is a welcome to everyone who has uh, joined us uh, tonight. We've got people from different parts of the continent, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe. I know um, some of our DBL students from Midland State University have joined us. Welcome. We've got colleagues from all over. Um, and uh, more will be joining us as we go on. I'm not so much worried about who's here and who's not, because this presentation will be made available. And so uh, I would like to get straight into uh, the, the, the program for, for, for the day. Um, what I thought we could uh, focus on today was uh, the aspect of academic writing. And I say here, academic writing made easy some will dispute that to say, well, easy is very subjective. Easy is very, um, um, you know, it depends uh, who you are, at what level you are. I was sharing with a, a colleague of mine who has uh, joined us at the University of Forte and is a, is a senior, is a, is a lecturer. And I, I, I was telling them that, you know what, I still get scared and uh, a bit worried when I have to submit a, um, a, a paper and uh, I get a rejection. It still scares me, you know, it always starts nicely. Dear Professor Chinyamurindi, we thank you for your manuscript which you submitted and then the tone kind of changes and it focuses more on um, uh, a, a negative, um, a negative aspect, uh, as we say. So uh, one can never ever claim to say they have arrived and they their writing is at a at a stage where they feel like they are the best or they are better. And I say to my colleague again today that you know I wish I was at your stage. I wish uh, when I was doing uh, my writing and the work that I was doing. I wish we, I had more mentors like you guys do nowadays where you can consult different people and ask them to say, look, uh, I need help with uh, such and such a, an activity. And, 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 and you know what? This is the exciting thing about the work that we currently do, that um, things get better through the progression of time. You know, what was a, a challenge in my time when I was doing my undergraduate studies and in your time uh, is totally different. Um, someone, I, I was listening to an interview um, um, of, um, uh, in fact, it was uh, Julius Malema who was um, uh, speaking at, the, at a birthday function. And in his talk, he praises um, former Kaiser Chiefs um, uh, uh, football player, Dr. Kumalo. And he says, you know, you, 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 you became popular at a time when there was no social media. Because nowadays it's easy to get popular because of social media, even get popular for the, for the wrong reasons. So, so this is just a, a reflection I had when I was uh, looking at all of this to say, 
you, you know what, colleagues, um, we are also living in, 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 in great times. Now, what I want to do so that I don't uh, confuse some of you is so that uh, at least there is not, nothing appearing on the screen to block your, your view. I think it's going to work now. So, so what we're going to look at um, in the next few moments is probably something that I think is very key uh, to every one of us that is here because of the work that we do as scholars, uh, which is to look at the importance of academic writing, which is to look at how we experience and how we frame academic writing. For some people, it, it, it um. is... Uh, it's a threat and it's, a, it's, it's something that's difficult uh, to deal with and manage. But I, I hope some of the tips that I will share with you are going to help you as we go on this journey so that um, uh, it becomes uh, uh, bearable. Um, and uh, the starting point is I, I had initially drafted uh, 15 points uh, but then I, I extended it to, to 20. And so you're going to see some of these uh, points as we, as, we, as we go on. I think importantly, what I want you to get as a take home is the importance of uh, not just academic writing, uh, but the importance of discipline in, 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 in how we write. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those experiences that I've had um, as a scholar and working with other people in, in, in collaborative projects uh, on uh, how to deal with um, with academic writing. So the first thing uh, is that I want to acknowledge uh, some references. Uh, I think uh, it's important we acknowledge these references because these references become uh, critical in also uh, some of the resources I'm going to share with you. Some of these resources have been shared by some of my friends uh, in academia and I acknowledge them and so uh, when you get the presentation you'll notice that um, you, you'll see where each and every one of them is coming from. Uh, importantly what I would like you to enjoy please enjoy the the presentation and reflect on it and how it can help you in in the way that you write and approach the the, 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 the project of writing which is not an easy project um, and I should add it's not a once-off project as well. It's a project that requires all of us to uh, be continuously doing as I, as I will share uh, with you. So the first pointer um, that I thought I would share with you is uh, be aware of the referencing convention. I think for, fundamentally for me, this becomes an important starting point to say, what is the referencing style that I'm supposed to work on in this thesis, in this dissertation? in this uh, publication that I'm working on. By understanding the referencing style that you're going to be working with, you actually make the job a lot easier. Uh, in 60% in of the cases where I review work in the early years of my career, I'll spend a lot of time correcting students on conventions of the referencing that they were supposed to use. So it predominantly because of my background in organizational psychology behavior, I, 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 we predominantly use APA. So I would spend a lot of time, but nowadays what I do, I say to students, uh, the style guide is there and I present the students with the style guide right at the start to say, here is the style guide this is your manual. You have a choice whether you're going to follow what your style guide says or you're going to uh, uh, do things your own way. And trust me, when I say do things your own way, uh, some students end up also uh, uh, doing things their own way. And um, one of the most sad things that often uh, comes about as part of the process is when a student gets told by an examiner uh, that your referencing is out of touch, you have not adhered to the style guide that you are supposed to, to, to adhere to. So let's just get that out of the way. You must know from the onset what style guide you're going to use. Are you using APA? Are you using um, uh, Harvard? Are you using Chicago? Are you using Cambridge? And then there are different conventions that um, 
come about uh, at different time periods. Uh, uh, but importantly, it's the consistency that you apply uh, in terms of the style guide that you're going to work with. Uh, so we work with the American Psychological Association or otherwise known as APA. For me, what makes APA very interesting is the multiple versions of APA that keep coming up. There are different editions that come up. There is the full edition. Uh, Q Johnson, please just, uh, yes, thank you. Just, um, yes, thank you. So there are different editions that come up. And, and the owners, I've got a colleague at UWC who's very good at knowing which edition uh, that we are at. So every time we, let's say, write a paper together, he always takes the liberty to correct me, to say, uh, your article is not adhering to the latest version. I think nowadays, um, they now do something called a DOI, where they allow you to put the reference, the internet link of the source, which I'll show you just now as, as we go ahead. So be aware of the convention. And for the purpose of this presentation, I, I will be elaborating more on the APA um, referencing style. So, so there are things that we know uh, about APA and uh, the style that we use here, that there are two types of referencing techniques. There is in-text and the final reference list. Um, and, and I give examples there taken from other sources here, uh, what you do. So, so, so often students struggle with this idea of voice to say, I, I want to share my idea but I'm not sure at what point do I put in my idea. And I want to, and I will elaborate this in the second point. There is no such thing as too much referencing, but you can suffer from under-referencing, which is the flip side of it all. Sometimes students feel that when they reference a lot, um, they are losing their voice. Ideally, we, we, referencing is a, a form of scholarly, um, um, activity where you as a as a scholar are putting yourself into a, a, a discipline where you are conforming to the requirements of that discipline so that people are also aware of what is required or what happens within that discipline so there's no such thing and i will elaborate on that so here's just some techniques with in-text referencing um in the first point they mention what caruth says and they put caruth's exact words sometimes the exact words help in terms of getting the point across and in the second point they also do the same approach but they uh, without a signal phrase which is also helpful uh, but ideally what we are just trying to show you here is that writing is not meant to be boring down you are meant to uh, in as much as you can try and integrate a range and a plethora of um uh, writing techniques so that there's they, some form of variety and the, some, of, some form of variation in how you present sources. Another one uh, where they, in this case, they do not take the exact words of what Smith is saying, but they take the idea. So sometimes students, um, particularly within the the realm of uh, dynamic capabilities or, or which, which, which I'm working on currently, can take an idea and say, well, these are my own words, but then the, 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 the idea which is underlying is uh, attributed to a particular source. So it then ceases to be your word because the idea is there. So if I say to you, um, one of my mantras in life is just do it. So if you know very well that, well, that's a catchy phrase that's used by Nike. So uh, you, you cannot, uh, 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 claim preserved to it to say it's my own catchy word. So there's nothing wrong with also writing without necessarily putting quotations all the time. Some students suffer from that to say, I must put a quote. It, it, when you read the style guide, and these style guides are available online, just Google whatever style guide you use, you'll actually see that it's, um, it's well captured in terms of uh, the assistance that it can provide you. So that's, that's, that's the, the, the starting point, is that there's variation, be aware of the variation, and, and we can talk about that. There are the rules that we are aware of, uh, for instance, um, 
the first time when you cite two or three authors, um, three or more authors, you cite their full names at first. Thereafter, you use the word et al. Those are things that uh, uh, we expect you to know as you embark on the project of writing. What are the conventions in your area? And uh, conform to those conventions as a way of actually uh, making sure that uh, you, 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 you are aware of, of, of what's going on. And, and, and sometimes what's difficult for some people is to read the style guide a little bit later on after they've done what they've um, they, they, they've done the writing project and then subsequently are uh, then engaged in the process of trying to make sure that uh, they, 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 they they change all those style guides uh, to, to conform know it from the start um, and, and, and and I promise you you won't you won't get lost there. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there with the, the APA referencing style. Uh, oh, this is the DOA part I was talking about. Some journals nowadays would want you to put a, a, an active DOA number, um, which is really a link, if you say, a, a recognizable uh, um, a pattern of numbers that identify where the publication is found. And you'll find that is, is becoming very common particularly in uh, in the international uh, journal space as well, even the local one as well. Um, number two, so tip one as to know the referencing style guide, but number two, I, I want to say always support whatever claims that you are making. You can never over-reference, but are prone to under-reference. Okay, so uh, you can never over-reference, but you are prone to under-reference. And, 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 and this is the experience sometimes um, uh, where I have seen people think that referencing a lot uh, takes away your mojo and your style as an author. And so people are not so uh, particular about the, experiencing of, or the experience of always referencing. They prefer to take a back seat and, and rather under-reference. I wanna give you an example uh, taken from um, a, an introductory chapter of one of my PhD students who, who's in the final phases of writing up. Um, and, 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 and I love where we've come with this student because when I reflect where he started off and where he is now, uh, as a supervisor, I, 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 I smile, I, I am filled with the, a sense of pride because I can see that um, there is remarkable improvement. So here's a, a, an opening paragraph that you'll find in the introduction of his, uh, his uh, PhD thesis. There is acknowledgement of the importance of identity in how entrepreneurs behave. So keyword here is acknowledgement. So if there is an acknowledgement, that means that there's a sense of community around that idea. Therefore, that must be referenced. Uh, and then he puts the references there. Uh, and sometimes uh, be careful, we can get caught up in the idea of uh, saying words like there's an acknowledgement, but then we discover that actually uh, the, the ideas and the words that we are verbalizing are, are, are ideas that are shared by only a few uh, individuals. So in this case, what he does is he realizes that this acknowledgement is a shared community acknowledgement, not just amongst one set of scholars, but multiple scholars. And so he does that, he actually put it there. So it's like taking a sentence in your, in your writing and you say, um, scholars believe that the economy is facing challenges. Uh, by virtue of you positioning this to be an idea that is shared by a community of scholars, we are therefore saying that it's not one scholar, but it's a set of scholars that are believing that. And because it's a set of scholars that are believing that, the idea then is that you need to be prudent and, 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 and do the work of referencing and showing that it's not just one scholar who believes that, but it's a range of scholars. And that's the type of awareness of, or reflexivity that we are expecting that uh, you as a writer should have. You should, every sentence, we'll talk about that later on, should make sense to you and pro probably to the person who's reading your work. 
And so, uh, according to Ven Venkataram uh, 2019, decisions which are taken by entrepreneurs uh, as they start their business can either limit or enhance the business's evolution, which implies its performance. So see what he does in that line. He introduces the view of a scholar, but uh, the, 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 the view of the scholar is limited to this idea of evolution of the business. But then he then adds his own line of interpretation, which implies that, well, the aspect of evolution can also be linked to um, issues related to um, um, performance. And that's the type of awareness and conscientiousness that we're expecting when, when, when people are, 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 are writing. And then he continues further uh, by saying, the creation of a country's wealth depends upon it, the competitiveness of its business, comma, which makes nations rely fundamentally on capabilities. You can see where it's already going because um, uh, he's now arguing that the importance of capabilities should feature in, in wealth creation and, 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 and nation building. The next thing that he does next is he makes sure that he keeps the reader in the loop. Entrepreneurs have played an integral role in building successful economies across the globe. And he puts the reference there. And according to Ventegataram, entrepreneurs have found themselves in situations where they have considerable number of challenges in their operations, which have driven so much attention from researchers. Entrepreneurship, career identity, and its influence through business effectuation remains, therefore, an under-researched phenomenon. Now, what can we learn from that? Some ideas you can pick up that can help with um, aspects related to writing. Uh, the first one is a claim with reference support in the Vent Kataram uh, uh, line. It's a continuation of a thread or an idea. So he doesn't start something and he finishes uh, it down. He makes sure that he's developing a line of reason or the reasoning or the pattern of thought that he wants his reader to be aware of. And that's, that's, that, that to me is, is fundamental and very um, uh, conscious in terms of the writing. You will see, I like to use this word conscious writing. I, I believe that writing should be exactly like that. It shouldn't be about sitting and wishing to write uh, volumes and volumes of text. It's about making sure that every line and every sentence uh, makes sense. So in that line, therefore, you can then see where it's going, because what he's now doing is a logical build-up of his area. So the last sentence for me uh, is, is the killer punch, because it shows us where this research is going to be located and what he wants to, uh, to, 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 to understand and explore. Now, friends, colleagues, this doesn't come with um, uh, one sitting of uh, uh, you're sitting be behind a desk and within one sitting ah, you've got it right this comes really with a lot of thoughtful reflection a lot of um making sure that you you are aware and and, and, and after two years as he's about to end in the his thesis for me it's exciting because it, it shows me how he's also um uh, grown and improved as a scholar uh, in terms of the, the the work that he does. And, and it should be mentioned that there is this remarkable improvement in this work. So tip number three, let us learn and master the art of writing short sentences that link or show a golden thread. And it happens a lot in, 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 in when, when we are still new to the idea of writing. We like to write longer sentences, uh, put as many ideas as we can. But this is a tip that I got given by one of my supervisors when I did um, my PhD. And, and, and the, the exciting thing about that was that I did my PhD in the UK and I was um, an African student that had just come uh, with the experience of being in Ireland and had now ended up in the UK. And so um, there was a huge, huge culture shock in terms of the, the context that I was in. And so much and parcel of what I had been taught how to write had been 
not sustained writing. It was writing where I was only working on a few sets of uh, written pieces and then submit. So one of my supervisors actually advised me to say, get into the habit of writing short sentences. There's no harm when you write a short sentence, but you tend to lose the thought pattern of your audience when you try to make your sentences long and um, you know unbearable sometimes to the audience that you're writing to. So, so the, the, the idea and the lesson here is get into the habit of writing short sentences. I wanna share with you again from my student here who, uh, look, look at that first sentence. This study has policy implication. And that's a short sentence. Ordinarily, somebody would write, this study has policy implication that extends not only to the work of practitioners, but it also extends to the work of uh, academics who are interested in policy development in this specific area. So already there's a lot of thoughts going on there. But the idea now is to look at um, that short sentence. And what, what, what he then does from that short sentence is to make sure that he builds up the ideas of the policy implications of the study by looking at the range of policy implications. He talks about the Department of Small Business Development benefiting from the study. He goes and links it with the Sustainable Development Goals. He talks about um, uh, the, the SMME context. So every other sentence appears to be supported by that first short sentence. And so the argument being made, which I'm making here is that uh, after you've written something, take time to look at what you've written and ask yourself, am I writing short, concise, thorough statements or sentences that will help me? And make sure you then build up every other line from those uh, short, concise uh, statements that you, you, you are positioning. Number four, locate a gap through a gap table. I was talking to one of my mentees this afternoon um, uh, and, and they asked me a question to say, how do you know what a literature gap is or what the literature review or what, what is the contribution of the study or the gap of the study is? And I say to them, well, there are two ways of wanting to know this. The first way you can do this is to sit and then say, I'm just going to write. And as I write, that will come through. The second way, which I, I, I learned also through different colleagues, is to create a, 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 a gap table. A gap table is really meant to just outline the different gaps that exist in the literature. Now, you may not be able to see that clearly, but when you get the slides, you'll be able to do so. Uh, so what I did in this article, this was an article published in the South African Journal of Human Resources Management. What I was trying to study is to understand how success is framed by women um, who are in a corporate setting. And so what I did was that I went and said, okay, I want to understand within an African context or a Southern African context, what do we know about studies around career success? And drew a gap table, and in the gap table, I had uh, um, uh, uh, certain sections in it: the author or the authors, the context and the method that is used, the research design and the uh, methods that were used, the findings. And critically, on the findings part, it's also important because uh, if you conduct research that merely confirms previous findings. It's helpful because it confirms that, yes, but sometimes you know, we, we are also interested in research that helps us to understand um, uh, phenomena in a new different way, which, which those who are in, in PhD programs would call um, the, the contribution of the study or the contribution angle that you are punting and wanting to push for. So when I did this table, I then started doing what students uh, would do and scholars do, downloading articles, get as many articles as I can. But the nice part is that I had a point of reference in terms of which articles I wanted to look at and which articles I was not prepared to look at. So what I was interested in here are articles which are published in a static context, 
with a focus on this topic of career success. And then I went and found some articles. The uh, first one was uh, by my colleague from the University of Botswana, Mpo Peko. And I wrote that Mpo used Botswana female managers, used the qualitative approach. These were some of the salient findings. I went, uh, put in a range of, um, of, 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 of articles. In fact, it wasn't a static context. My pro it was in a, a general context. In fact, the gap then was then not much work has been done in a static context. So after you've done the table, the, the next thing that you then do is critical because the next thing that you then do helps you to then see what has been done importantly but number two it also helps you to uh, see what has not been done and that then becomes useful and important and critical for me in um, helping me to be able to see where the gap is so you might be sitting right now as a master's student as a phd student and you are wanting an idea to say okay my supervisor is going to ask me for an idea where is the idea this is a nice clean safe way of finding some form of a, a gap and also in article writing i always use it if i want to justify the necessity of a, a particular angle that i want to look at but remember the effectiveness of this approach is not you repeating what somebody else has done the effectiveness of this approach is extending what somebody else has done. So what I see uh, from them is the role of culture. So we can extend that to say, well, culture in this context has been defined by the traditional means of bureaucratic, autocratic, classes fair. But I want to also look at culture within an African context, an African cultural perspective of understanding issues of success. And then that gives you a leeway of understanding. It also gives you a platform in as you write to praise what others have done, but it also gives you a leeway of, uh, of also uh, noticing what, where others have missed certain gaps, which you can and, and feel to help your, your studies. And then only two weeks ago, I learned of this one from my colleague, um, Dr. Ellen Rungani, who is with me in the Department of Business Management here. Um, what this is, she argues the importance of using a roadmap. And she said to me that uh, when she was doing her PhD, she first created a roadmap to be able to know uh, like a structure of where she wants to take her, 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 her study towards. So uh, Dr. Rungani did her PhD on um, SMEs in the Eastern Cape, particularly issues related to financing. Um, and so the roadmap, which is about a PDF document I can share with you as well, actually then was an outline of the different chapters that she has, because she could now easily identify what chapter one does. Now, what I've done is I've only I'm only showing you the first chap the first page of the roadmap, but it's actually a comprehensive three page document. But what you can see is she can sit down and uh, pinpoint the range of information that she has. So if she were to find information on multinational corporations and, and financing models, she would then say, okay, let me go back to my roadmap. Is this covered? No, it's not covered in the roadmap. Therefore, I should not be looking at it. There's no point in spending time looking at aspects that you're not going to uh, focus upon. And I think this for me is something I'm recommending. I've sent it to some of my colleagues and uh, friends with permission from Dr. Rungani, of course, and she's agreed to share this. This is a brilliant, brilliant tool to use as you start your journey. In fact, what I would like to do uh, as part of my own reflections as, a, as, a, as, a, as an academic is to say every student before they start their masters, their PhD, their honors, they first work on the roadmap and the roadmap offers a useful platform and an outlet through which they can uh, then focus on the range of themes that they're going to cover. It also is a good tool for people like me who can easily get um, taken by so many things that are happening to say, ah, ah, this must be within the parameters of, of the roadmap. 
I can send that to you. Uh, it, it's widely available. And it, she, she outlines her chapter one, which is her proposal. She's got her two literature chapters, which is chapter two and chapter three. She's got her methodology chapter where she explains her methods. She's got her results chapter and ultimately it links. And every little thing of these, if we could have done it differently, every arrow would be connecting each and every one of the chapters. And that's also nice because the roadmap uh, also is a discussion document that you can use with your uh, supervisor to sit down and say, okay, supervisor, this is the work that I'm envisaging to do. And I'm asking you to, you know, have a look and, and, and tell me what you, what you think about that. Then the other thing which we must talk about, which is not easy, especially to those that are engaged in the project of writing a lot. Uh, initially, I had written that self-plagiarism must be avoided. I had to rethink, and I said self-plagiarism is wrong. Now, let's go back to the roadmap. The way our, um, our, our, our dissertations are made up in most countries and in most contexts is that Chapter one, which is your proposal, and subsequently then get changed right at the end, um, also covers aspects related to methodology. So what a lot of my students are doing or like to do is, because they would have covered the aspects of methodology in chapter one, which will then feature again in chapter four, maybe in depth, when we then ask them to then, you know, what is their ontological, epistemological framing of the study? Um, what they then do is they just go and copy what they've done in chapter one into chapter four. Now, that is an example of self-plagiarism. Uh, so, if you thought uh, plagiarism only consisted of plagiarizing from other scholars, you can also take ideas that you've taken from yourself. I mean, a range of definitions are, 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 are proposed. It's a common practice um, in dissertation and thesis writing. You are handing in a paper you've already submitted in another class, pasting sections of paragraphs on previously submitted so, uh, works. So, so those that are doing coursework, Let's say um, your supervisor gives you work to do on um, uh, discussing the implications of uh, organizational culture on how businesses and organizations exist. And then what you end up doing is that, okay, fine, I've seen the implications. What I'm going to do next is next year when I'm writing my thesis as part of this, I've got this paper ready. I'll just go and take that paper, paste it in the thesis. Now, we are not refuting the idea that this is your work. What we are against here is this idea that uh, this work is uh, solely independent. Uh, th this work is, is, is located and framed in a particular context, which can, it can be multiplied or replicated easily because what we try to establish is that uh, have a, a point of reference where you can then say, listen, it is my work, but I must find a way of uh, uh, presenting it again in a way that does not create these uh, complexities that we are referring to around the issues of uh, plagiarism. And this is a very, very serious thing, and um, uh, we, which I, I'm strongly advising people to really have a rethink because it, it has implication in terms of even uh, the work we do as scholars and in locating our our work to to other people so wrong 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 um submitting a manuscript for publication containing data conclusions or passages that have already been published without citing your previous publication uh, it's called salami slicing sometimes when people prefer to just cut it up so that they can re-present uh, it and, uh, in different contexts to different uh, areas. So let's avoid that um, uh, type of writing. Tip number seven, practice signposting. Uh, it's a writing tool and a little technique somebody taught me as well. Uh, for this, uh, I, I, I often have to take you back to 
a home and um, if i'm going to take a journey on a, or a long journey somewhere uh there are always these signs that are there uh, to tell me how far i am or how near i am uh to to that particular journey that i'm a destination where i'm where i'm going and that's true also in writing within writing you can practice some form of um signposting and signposting in this in this case is defined as any form of aided writing inside the document that makes or tells the reader of key transitions from one idea to the other any form of aided writing that tells the reader from one transition to the other we we've recently published a paper in the journal employee relations uh and 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 i give an example of that so we we've put our paragraphs there about the study and watch what we do in the next paragraph the article follows a structure so what we are doing basically to our reader is saying reader we 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 don't want you to just be guessing what's going to be going next or what's going to be happening next we are actually going to be providing you with uh, signposts these signposts are not also helpful for you uh, but also helpful for us in terms of the ideas that we're going to share. So signposts happen all the time as you make a transition from one section to the other. It's also a good point. Let's say if you are making transition from one section, which was looking at the, the impact of decent work on um, work performance, and then now you have explored aspects related to decent work, and now you want to look at aspects related to work performance. So as you make that transition, you can then argue to the reader to say, the next section is linked to the previous, full stop. Uh, the previous section explored decent work. This section gives focus to the linkages that exist between decent work and work performance. Signposting is a good, good way of showing that you're an organized writer. And then you are also an idea who's a writer who's logical who is interested in making sure that ideas develop in a, in a pattern that is not haphazard, but in a pattern that helps the reader to be able to uh, understand the range of uh, ideas that are there in a particular written text. And this doesn't come with um, at one strike. As you go on, you, you, you become better at it and uh, and, and to, to, to those that are working particularly on masters and PhDs it's something that I would advise you practice at a early stage of your uh, uh, writing uh, project so that it becomes ingrained in in what you do tip number eight remember we've got 20 so brace with, bear with me um, tip number eight strike a balance between being critical and being descriptive a lot of my students will notice I like to always write, this is descriptive writing, descriptive writing, descriptive writing. Descriptive writing is saying, this past weekend, I went to the shops, I had a haircut, I, I took my son for a haircut as well, I hung out with my family, blah, 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 you go on, you go on. That's descriptive writing because what you're doing is you're putting a pattern of description in your writing. Critical writing is, is, is the type of writing that then gets us to know some of the underlying causes leading to those decisions. So why did you go for a haircut? Well, my hair had grown and I, I needed a haircut. So we're going beyond the obvious of what we know about what you did to try and under, to understand some of the underlying causes and patterns of explanation of why you did what you did. Uh, descriptive writing and critical writing are needed at master's PhD level, we agree. But what we need, as I will argue even to some of my students, is the necessity of balance. There's a room where descriptive writing fits in, and there's also a place where we need to be critical. And by being critical, we need to go beyond the, the surface, the, 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 the top of the iceberg, to go to the surface to understand why certain things are like the way they are. And the more you get into um, writing, the more you're caught up into the necessity of, 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 of striking a balance between um, those types um, of, 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 of writing. Um, a friend of mine, 
um, what asked me, um, uh, how then do we strike the balance? Well, think of it this way. If you're going to sit, uh, uh, have a meal with somebody close to you, there is small talk and deep talk. I, I give this as an example, um, a crazy example. So I stay in East London and between East London and, um, uh, and uh, Port Elizabeth is maybe a total of 300 Ks, 300 Ks then. And then I get onto public transport. I'm onto public transport and then I'm sitting next to someone on public transport and we are talking. And then as we are sitting on uh, in the public transport, I then go straight for the jugular and ask the person, so have you had your COVID jab? And the person might look at me and say, well, even if I did, why would I tell you? Why, why would I be in a position of comfort to be able to share with you something like that? But you start with small talk uh, and small talk sometimes is the weather. Uh, it's been raining here, so you could say, oh, nice weather we're having these days, so much for summer. And if a person knows uh, what you are referring to, they're like, oh, yeah, I see what you did there, so much for summer. Yeah, but it's not like that all the time. Yeah, I agree with you. Oh, by the way, I used to stay in this place. And already as you're going on the journey, patterns of uh, conversation are emerging. And the, the, the more you get into the journey, the deeper the conversation gets. Uh, and, and that allows us then to be in a position where we are actually uh, more free to share what we want to do. And that's what writing is also about. Writing is about, it, 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 it's this uh, brilliant process of release where you um, are not attempting to share all your ideas in one go, but trying to make sure that you are sharing your ideas in a logical manner and that a, that, a, that a reader can now get what you're doing, signposting, a balance between uh, descriptive and critique writing. And then I, I'll give you examples of some of the stuff that we've done. This is a book that uh, recently published, um, edited by Melinda Kutsia and Alda Diaz, um, which is really about the psychological contract within the fourth industrial revolution era. And um, very fascinating book, I think, because it's got some very nice, bold ideas uh, that could help practitioners, particularly, particularly in the HR space. In this book, I offer examples of what a critique is and what a descriptive writing piece is. So this was the section where I was making an argument around uh, the necessity, excuse me, of the research that um, I'm doing. And, um, the, the, the point of uh, departure here is um, uh, th this balance that we have of not telling people what they already know. And you know, you get fascinated by these students who come to you and say, I want to study the fourth industrial revolution. And then they will define uh, what the fourth industrial revolution is, the work of Schwab and all of this. I mean, here in, in South Africa, they can talk about uh, the, the, the VC at UJ and, you know, all this stuff that's happening. But there's necessity to show that, that critique. So uh, in the line, such an understanding could contribute what understanding, the understanding around the emphasis of linking psychology with technological te technology could aid an understanding of addressing challenges experienced within industry 4.0 and how this relates to the experiences. Such studies are noted to have potential benefits in improving not just the experience of work, but those engaged in the work. So the experience of work becomes something obvious, but those engaged in that process, we center the human project at the center of understanding for IR. A focus on such studies becomes important, especially when there's evidence showing. I then go beyond actually saying why the study is important by quoting the work of Paul Poissard and Michelle May. And then an example of a descriptive writing. Well, the most common descriptive type of writing that we can be engaged in is when we define things, when we tell us that this and source is like this, uh, this phenomena is investigated in this way, and that's an example of continuous descriptive writing needed, but in some cases, uh, at the higher you go, and uh, we could look at it from the point of a PhD, the higher you go, the more you need to be more reflective, 
and more critical of the type of writing that you're going to be engaged in. Uh, from Canterbury, something, so, 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 an interesting document I saw, um, which uh, as, as part of it, if we were in a room, we would then give you an article and then say, analyze a paragraph. You can actually use this as a tool to actually improve on the level of description that you have. A colleague of mine sent me an, a request uh, over the weekend to say they've been asked to review a book and they don't know how and what they need to look out in that book. And one of the things I'm sending them is this table here to say the useful table, which asks you to say, uh, against these uh, indicators, how has the writer fared in communicating those ideas? So the more uh, you can find stuff to write, uh, it, it, it could be a measure and an indicator of the level of depth that that writer has, has engaged in. And, and, and it's all subjective, but it offers a, 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 a useful point of uh, departure and going forward. Tip number nine, we're almost halfway. Learn to use paragraphs. Learn to use paragraphs. And I, it sounds so basic because that's what every English teacher likes to emphasize. But trust me, at PhD level, I've read the work of students where they don't use paragraphs, where they, um, they just write one voluminous text and there are no uh, ideas that are, are being put there. So paragraphs, offer us a way of putting structure. They offer us a way of um, showing one idea to the other. They also offer us an aspect of making sure that um, we, we can signpost and we can also show that we have some form of coherence in terms of what we want the reader to know in terms of the logical development of, of the type of writing that we're trying to achieve. Here's an example of a paragraph. Now, I took this and I've attributed the source. I, 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 I don't know anything about this particular context. It's on university education and stuff. But here is the paragraph. Now, at this university, when they are teaching students on how to write good, effective paragraphs, they then juxtapose that paragraph to an instrument about what makes a great paragraph. And they use the word peel, like peel for a for a for a for a banana peel, uh, and and the illustration is well made because uh, when you're peeling a banana, it's layer by layer, uh, you know, of the peels, and then ultimately it exposes what 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 you can eat. So the P stands for this is the point you want to make in support of the topic or sentence. So every paragraph must have a P, which is the point being made. Now, the next point is an E. This is where you provide evidence to support your point. So you don't make claims in the paragraph that are not um, supported by facts. And remember the second point that we made, you, there's no harm in over-referencing, but there is something problematic when we under-reference. So the E is for providing evidence that could be helped, that could help you in supporting the points that you're making. The other E is explaining, I guess this is where the D comes in, the descriptive part. Make sure you explain why your evidence uh, uh, supports your point, a balance between descriptive and critical writing. And then the L is for link and concluding. Everything must ultimately show the link and the conclusion of ultimately what you want to achieve. So. I was reviewing uh, work of one of my students today who is researching aspects related to intellectual capital within within small businesses and the dynamic capability perspective, blah, 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 blah. But what they did then was that they then argue that, you know, this study has based in a number of, um, is, is covered by a range of instruments that are found on the African continent. What do they talk about? They talk about the, African Union, Agenda 2063, they talk about um, Millennium uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. But then when it then comes to the part of SADC, they couldn't find a specific instrument within SADC. And so they just wrote as a subheading uh, SADC. But out of consistency, you then can go back and say, oh, hold up. The other parts you're mentioning instruments which are available in these structures, which is perfectly fine. 
But in this other part, you don't mention the instrument, you're just mentioning the entire body. And so as a result, when I read that particular paragraph, the ideas discovered in that peel do not come out. So what would they do at this university? They then can juxtapose where the aspects of each of those comes in and then by color point. So the P part, uh, the peel part is available in red, the evidence part, and the evidence part, obviously we expect referencing. You can see they've put references there. And the linking part, which is the bottom part, I think this is a nice, brilliant tool. Unfortunately, if your thesis is worth uh, 50,000 words for a master's for argument's sake, um, this might be very laborious and uh, take a long time for you to get used to. But I think if you develop this early in your academic writing, what it then does, it really helps you to shoot into uh, becoming better at, at the writing project. So I, I actually enjoyed this um, this exercise. Sentences, we're halfway now. Sentences are important because they're a sequence of words that tell us the ideas that you're trying to build up. But the sentence must also make sense as a single unit. So avoid having sentences inside a paragraph where aspects of the sentence do not link with what the overall paragraph is trying to cover. Um, sentence writing, create an objective, confident voice. Uh, the research shows that. Uh, Smith's argument illustrates that. So you're standing. Uh, I, I often imagine this to be um, a naughty type of standing where you can stand up with your hands in your pocket and you're addressing, you imagine you're addressing the House of Parliament or Parliament and you're about to make a point and uh, you, you, you put your hands in your pocket you close your eyes and one hand comes out of the pocket and you're, you're, you're reaching out to, to raise the point to say, the argument here, as, as we have seen in work done by, and, 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 and for me, it's like positioning some form of authority to the work to say, I'm not just basing what I'm saying on uh, feel good, you know, emotions or gut feel, but it's really based on um, uh, some form of, uh, confidence in terms of how I am structuring the ideas that I'm presenting. Uh, use appropriate language for your audience and purpose. So simple things, you can't use the word don't, can't, it's, and, and, and it's actually become difficult for people to avoid this type of writing because this is the type of writing that we write in uh, text messages and um, predictive text and sometimes got it. Like like for me, I, I, I've spelled uh, for predictive text, the word uh, morning with an H. For some reason, I was probably in traffic and I just wanted to write morning and I wrote with an H and it saved it. So sometimes when when I send the word morning, it will appear with an H because those, those are the types of writings that are you know common. The most important thing is the idea of morning. But really, for some in academic writing, that transition and that respect in terms of language must also be be, be afforded. Use language um, sensitively. Um, here in South Africa, we are in the midst of, a, of an interesting debate and an experience that happened to one um, excuse me one um, black leader, where uh, the word experiment was used to describe the experience of that one black leader in a predominantly white preserve type of political party. And so uh, the argument being made is that, well, the use of the word experiment becomes insensitive because if you could imagine what an experiment is, it really uh, is uh, whatever comes uh, as part of the test, whether successful or not, uh, we don't dispute that. The results are, are just uh, confirmed by the necessity of the experiment. So, so language is like that. I, I remember um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a student of literature, having studied um, the book Julius Caesar and um, a line in which Shakespeare writes the entrance of Caesar into, uh, and, uh, into, the, uh, into a hall or something like that. And Shakespeare writes, enter Caesar and his train of followers. And I was so amazed by that usage of the word train of followers. I said, 
Wow. And I then remember uh, it, it being chosen to be the secretary of the prefect's uh, body. And um, one day the headmaster was late for an afternoon meeting with the prefect. And one of the things you're learning, uh, you know, in a high school context is minute taking. And we are told that you must record everything to the minute detail. And the meeting was supposed to start at two. The headmaster arrived at 20 past two. And then I write in the minutes, enter the headmaster and his train of followers. And having to sit and be in trouble for that because if your usage of the word train presupposes that everybody who was part of the headmaster's entourage was just being led with no brain to think for themselves. And, and that's where the transition points are needed, colleagues, that writing is not easy. Writing is a, is a project that you must dedicate yourself to. I, I often get troubled by people who are working on uh, PhDs, master's students, who, who, who don't commit to the writing project, who sit and, 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 and then when the deadline then comes, they push and say, okay, I'm going to use the deadline to push me. I'm going to show you later on when we're about to end some tips around uh, getting out of your comfort zone and getting you to write. So language must be used uh, sensitively. Tip number 11, learn to self-edit. And, and that's the greatest form of edit, the, the editing that you can ever do when you read your own work. I have learned and loved this part, especially when I'm writing for newspapers. Um, in most cases, if I show you an article published in the Mail and Guardian, the Daily Dispatch, or the Sunday Times, or the City Press, which I would have written, and how a journalist then works on that article, and what ends up getting published, I end up admitting myself to say, wow, uh, there's a lot I don't know about language, and there's a lot I'm learning also about language, just by looking at what others are doing. So the first type of editor, in any project of writing is you as the writer. You must be able to be in a position where you can edit your stuff and you can put yourself under critique also to say, I'm going to edit. It becomes erroneous to always think that the, the supervisor is going to do the work of editing. And allow me to also say this, I say this to students as well. My job is not to edit the work. Okay, my job is to read the work for its scientific merit and scientific quality as a basis of it being presented to the scientific community. And we, we then make it compulsory as, as, as examination or, or research bodies that students must then take work to language editors. And that in itself is also helpful. But make sure you get into the habit of self editing because what self editing does helps you to also it helps you to also see the errors of your ways and where you can also correct it also presents you uh, an opportunity to also see areas where your um, um uh, writing is to improve i like that point it's less likely to annoy your 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 supervisor and, and i totally agree because uh, supervisors in my my interpretation are not supposed to be doing the work of editing volumes of work the supervisor is to sit and appreciate the work for its scientific quality, and that's what they do. I am a language editor, and, um, and, 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 and somebody once asked me, but you've published quite a lot, why do you still need a language editor? And I say, well, I, I can write uh, about dynamic capabilities and all these concepts within human capital management and all of that, which is nice, you know, but the language editor sometimes can help me to make sure that I go overboard with the, the, with the number of words I use to also assist in terms of actually how I develop as a writer. So having a language editor is not um, a bad thing at all. It also helps. They are, they are very expensive. So they also claim sometimes it's become a business for some people where they claim to be language editors but uh, the exercise is worthwhile in terms of actually helping you progress with your work. Um, what should you look for as you self-edit your work, your voice? Importantly, don't neglect that the work should be about you and what you are trying to achieve. Look at the, the flow of ideas, how they link up together. 
look at aspects of referencing, which we spoke as tip number one. And remember that balance between descriptive and critical writing. And the higher you go at PhD level, we're expecting you to show more levels of uh, 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 critique and engagement. So take a break sometimes, uh, print the work. This is what I have learned sometimes when I have finished the manuscript. Um, uh, I prefer to read it on paper. Sometimes when you read it on screen, it's like uh, you're more likely to skip words. Uh, I prefer to read it on paper. Uh, students work, I prefer to print it and read it on paper. And, and, and that's actually just as a personal preference in terms of how I choose to work. Reading out aloud, um, Yes, uh, unconventional, but it also helps because sometimes when you read it in your head, uh, your brain allows to automatically correct some of the errors. But when you read it aloud, like imagine you are reading a slot on, on, on main, main, the, the TV station where, or the, the radio station related to a segment of your work, it really helps you. Uh, using spell, spell check, Grammarly, friends, we, I do this with the honors students. Um, where after they are now ready to submit, I make them exchange their work. So uh, first time I did this, I had four students. So I made them exchange their work. Each one had to go with the other one's dissertation for a weekend, and they read it and to look for errors. And what was fascinating then is that they could now easily see the errors that some of they, their friends were making and how they also uh, are framed within the reality of what they are doing. Use of linking words. Linking words are those types of words that you know, we can't do without, but they just are a nice, clever way. Instead of saying, um, put differently, you can use the word conversely. Uh, you know, it, it's also playing to the gallery so that you just don't have certain glitch words that you use but you can easily have a range and a plethora of words that could use. Um, my students like to make fun of me sometimes uh, to say, no, the problem with you is you, you like to speak Woolworths English. And I said, well, there's no such thing as Woolworths English. The, the idea is that English should offer you an opportunity. And, and, and we are having this debate about language still. It should offer you an opportunity to use different types of words to communicate ideas, make it more interesting, make capture the reader's imagination. And for me, in a misguided way, I thought saying enter the headmaster and his train of followers was a very nice, clever way of capturing the attention of anybody who would be reading bo boring, dull uh, prefects meeting, uh, me meeting minutes. But, but, but there's also a room for us to learn of linking words. And here are a range of linking words. Let's say if you're de describing similarities, you will see that in my writing. Most, mostly I, I try to avoid the longer words. So I would say conversely, comma, and I write whatever I want to base it as a comparison. Likewise, uh, equally, consequently. Of course, you, 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 you develop this as you go on. But uh, linking words are just a nice platform of making sure that your ideas and your, your, your work um, uh, you know, is supported by the type of language to use. And you can have uh, other words like when you're emphasizing, when you're concluding. Uh, sometimes uh, I remember uh, people sometimes in a, in a context of church when somebody's about to end, the sermon and they keep on saying as i as i'm about to sit down and then they stretch another idea as i'm about to sit down they stretch another idea so what, what that does is that it can also be a a platform of keeping your audience uh in in, in phases of expectation as i'm about to sit down or people are like okay we're gonna get to an end you know and then as i'm about so so conclude as you write your work, don't uh, prolong the conclusion, but make sure it, 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 it's a conclusion. It doesn't stretch and extend. And those are little tips and areas that we can uh, look at. I've put a website there where you can actually get these um, uh, linking words. Okay, almost there, seven more. Learn from others, constant reading. Now, number one, please 
do not get into the habit of thinking that you will improve your writing if you are not constantly reading other people's work. There is no such thing as a microwave a master's or a microwave PhD where you can say, I'm just going to write this in isolation and send. You will need to consult the body. You will need, if you're going to be saying, um, well, I'm working on writing capabilities, you will need to know who are the thought leaders in that area in your particular asset. I mean, if you come to me and say, um, you're working on HR related stuff in a South African context, is the name Stellan Como from the University of Pretoria, who's a very celebrated um, academic that we all look up to. If you're going to say you are going to be understanding issues related to psychology of work, or you're going to understand issues related to career psychology, there are people like um, uh, Mark Watson, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Nelson Mandela University. If you're going to be saying you're looking at you know, there's always a, a, a body of uh, thought leaders whose work you should be reading. But we don't read so that we become like those people. We read so that we can also contribute to the conversation. And that's that's a little trick somebody taught me about academic writing. And the, it was the illustration of a fire saying, imagine you're sitting around a campsite at night. And sitting around the campsite at night, everybody starts to converse about a particular topic. And then somebody says, okay, the topic of discussion today is the use of language as a weapon of oppression. And yeah, well, fascinating. And then somebody says, well, for instance, if somebody calls somebody an experiment, as done by Tony Lee and to Musi Maimani, I think there's a problem. And then somebody says, well, uh, conversely, uh, see what I did conversely, which is the previous point. It, it becomes very common as you as you um, as you learn about these things. Uh, you can use somebody else, and and what you are now having is a discussion, a broader discussion around a common subject that everybody should be engaged and focused upon, and that's what uh, uh, the the idea of reading from others does. We still need your voice but we also want you to be able to be constantly reading. I want to give you an example. Uh, for this example, I want you to imagine uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a first year MPhil student uh, at the Dublin Institute of Technology, I've just submitted my first written piece of writing to my supervisor, and my supervisor has shredded it to bits together with another student or two other students, and then she calls for a meeting and says, I want to see you guys between four and six, we need to discuss. And I'm thinking, but at five o'clock, I've got a part-time job that I'm doing. I have to be at work. And I had not canceled the shift that I was doing. And then I said, okay, I'm just gonna break it and sit there. And then she comes walking into this room with a presence and she throws these this article in front of us. And she says, for the next two hours, we are going to sit and analyze each sentence in this article. And this is a big article. This is taken from the Pink Journal. We call it the Pink Journal, the Strategic Management Journal. And we then sit for those two hours and we start reading this uh, piece by Bruce and Hunt called Learning to Plan and Planning to Learn. And, 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 and I'm just going to take you through the first part. This part alone that you see on your screen took us almost about uh, an hour of the time just analyzing watch the language that they use. A recent bitter debate between two prominent strategy academicians considers a question vital to the theory and practice of strategy. What types of planning should firms utilize in their strategy formation behaviors? And then every sentence we're going through it. And what it did, I kid you not, it really, really opened my eyes to the beauty that writing offers. Now, this journal article, this type of journal really, is a one, some, some, some people die wanting to enter and publish their articles in this journal. This is a timeless piece. In fact, this article has now been made freely available on the internet by um, the Strategic Management Journal because of the beautiful way that it's, it, it's written. But 
What did we learn from this experience? Learn from others, constantly read, constantly read. Know what's happening in your literature. And I'm going to show you one way you can do it. Please, please belong to the community of scholars, belong to the community around you, because this community is, a, is an environment in which you can also learn about the different things that are happening. And we all need that community. If you think of it right now, in one way or the other, you belong to a certain community that is helping you to shape you where you are. The nicest and the, 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 the most wonderful community I think I belong to is the online community found on ResearchGate. Um, and what I've done, I've just gone to ResearchGate just to show you what people are talking about. These are comments that have been posted between March and April. The type of conversations that people are having. Having. Um, and some, somebody asked April 2021 recently, what are the key ingredients of the perfect abstract for a doctoral dissertation? Non-threatening environment, you can ask a question no matter how stupid it is, no matter how complicated it is, and you can find people from all across the world responding and offering you advice. Here's another question. Can I use the same topic as my master's research or PhD? Again, non-threatening environment 21 answers 209 people reading that question how to how do you recognize and avoid dubious academic invitations we're all falling short of this i got an email today of some um person wanting to say i saw your profile on linkedin i would like to discuss a business proposition with you concerning uh, funds that we uh, that the late president of um tanzania uh, has wanted to, wanted to take out of Tanzania, which I think your bank account will be a useful outlet. Dubious, dubious things that are happening out there. But we all need a safe space where we can allow ourselves to be silly, where we can allow ourselves to be complicated, where we can allow ourselves to actually have other people to just answer us without uh, a, a threatening voice. Tip number 15, five more to go. Maintain academic integrity. This is now one of the most common practices that is happening nowadays, where people are now offering shortcuts to things that we um, um, we know and we we, we we work hard to achieve. And um, uh, I, I give you an example. Again, this was sent today, 13, well, 13 hours ago. Dear Dr. Wilichinya Murindi, the International Journal of Informatics and Communication Technology is offering publication in between. And I don't know what in between means, because something is missing there. Free publication at zero dollar cost, free access, open access and peer reviewed journal, fast and friendly response from our staff editor at work hour. Your paper will be processed quickly. We need your cooperation, especially in the revision stage. We have more than 100 papers cited by Scopus. So the journal covers all areas related to ICT, focusing on integrating hardware and solutions. You can find a recent article and please share this offer with your students or colleagues. Have a nice day. You can just see there's everything problematic here because whatever they are offering, the package that they are selling they want me to also share it so that the 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 the, the poison spreads to everybody else around uh, this quick way of getting published and getting your work out there and so what you must also maintain as a matter of integrity is knowing and keeping yourself safe in just saying oh i saw this article without vetting the science that are the, that has been done in that article. And this is where critique comes in. Because if you're able to critique, if you're reading an article, and in the article it says that the capital city of Harare of Zimbabwe is Cape Town. And you just read passing by. Well, if you're going to read critically, you would stop and say, hold on, that's not right. And because that's not right, I should be careful about the stuff that I'm reading in this particular article. So be conscious that academic integrity is important. There's a workshop happening tomorrow uh, run by the journal, um, the publishing house, Elsevier, uh, and they've got uh, people like uh, celebrated academic um, Professor Johan Morton, uh, who are talking about um, avoiding predatory journals 
and this is going to be quite interesting and i'm sure if you can still sign up for it they're still taking places a brilliant brilliant platform you learn about what's wrong with the industry by looking at what's happening so that when you're now faced with the decision also to vet out certain information you're in a position of uh, being empowered not just taking everything that you see and accepting as it is then how do i write well i've got a little recommendation i call it the 700 words rule each day try and write 700 words just try and write 700 words and 700 words if it's a lot say okay i'm going to start with 300 i'm going to start with 400 but try and write 700 words and the more you start writing, the more you you also uh, are able to uh, uh, make meaningful and worthwhile contribution. A challenge that often happens that, that then makes writing daunting for some people is when people don't take the time to reflect on what they're writing. So what they do is that they write according to the deadline. There's a deadline that's looming, I must now write. Uh, well, well, yes, you can do it when you're now senior and, you know, but for a, for a thesis uh, and a PhD project, a master's project, it, it, it's like a baby. Take care of that baby. And the more you take care of that baby, you start noticing uh, progressive uh, patterns of growth that you can actually measure and, and appraise. So each day, try and write 700 words. And and, and this is... This, this is um, these fancy watches that you see nowadays. So I hope everybody's watch from tomorrow will show uh, 700 words reached each day of writing. Tip number 17, three more to go. The use of platforms that exist that may convey the importance of academic um, material in a non-academic uh, way that is threatening. And the conversation is a brilliant, brilliant platform because this is an outlet through which researchers publish their work in a non-academic language approach, which is less threatening, but makes it into a publishing stable. So I've seen articles published in the in newspapers, which are adapted from the conversation, different range of themes. So if you're struggling in finding a topic for your PhD or for your master's or the topic that you're working on, uh, if you're working on the topic of COVID, for instance, it, these are nice areas because everybody is writing about COVID. And so you can go and read. And these are written with um, uh, editors who are helping the authors as they publish through the conversation. A brilliant, brilliant platform of also learning about academic writing. Use online electronic search journals. Uh, they do exist. These are specific to uh, the uh, academic realm, Google Scholar, uh, Wikipedia, yes, it would fit there, but I would say just avoid it. Try and look for more credible online academic search engines to help with your, with your work. And then tip number 19, support your writing project with other media and by other media i'm talking about news outlets so currently we're working on a project on decent work and constantly i i i i, I listen to ted talks listen to the radio listen to cnn and i'm not listening so that i can quote them i'm listening because in most cases Catherine was show on safm between 9 and 12. she'll probably interview a researcher who's probably doing work in the same area that I'm doing and already that's a useful feed to the work that I'm doing. Or on the BBC, if I watch Hard Talk, uh, you know, different types of outlets just open a way of release to your project. And the best tip uh, to all of you as the last tip for today, if all else fails, please remember miracles do happen. And this is a love from my son who was praying for water to turn into wine. And as you can see, he managed to do a good job and uh, miracles do happen, especially in writing projects. But to avoid the miracle events to happen, please, 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 please follow those 19 tips and you'll be able to hopefully succeed in the work that you um, want to do and the the, the projects that you want to work on as you write. 
I want to thank you for attending. Um, we're slightly ahead of time, so we're going to try and open out uh, a round of questions and um, yeah, hear what uh, colleagues think and then uh, we can uh, safely close. The presentation will be available. I will put it up on, on, on YouTube and also the slides. If you email me, I'll be able to, 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 to send them to you. Any questions or comments uh, people would like to uh, reflect upon? Or you can type in the comment uh, box. I, I understand uh, sometimes uh, unmuting can be daunting as well. Any questions or comments people would like to um, add to the presentation? Okay. Very informative. Excuse me, Prof. Excuse me, Prof. Marongwe, can I come in, please? Go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, the, the, the explanation was very good, and the examples that were given were very good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have learned quite a lot. I'm sure together with some of my colleagues who have joined this, uh, this session. Prof, would you help us on these issues? I often find problems with my students when it comes to a uh, quoting directly, uh, where you indicate the page number and also the year, then you quote, uh, you use uh, opening and closing inverted commas. Then when you are using that software of turn it in when you are checking for the amount of plagiarism, you find that that software highlights the, 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 the quotation and it becomes part of plagiarism. How can students um, reduce that and avoid that? Number two, Prof, it's on, I know tomorrow there's going to be a webinar on predatory journals, but to help those who may not be joining, how can one identify a predatory journal from an accredited list given by DHET? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marongwe, for that, uh, for those questions. I think we should, let's start with the first question on students. I think one of the things that we should be trying to do, Doc, is to expose students to the range of ways they can write ideas without not, without uh, relying on one single way of writing. And the most common way of writing is to put things in quotation. And that's what, what we were taught to say, um, um, if you want credibility in terms of uh, uh, not missing the point, you say, he can once say the following. You put it exactly in quotes in what he said, and that helps to stand as an idea of saying this is what the person said. But you can you can equally try to expose students to say there are a range of techniques they could use. Paraphrasing, for instance, that I can still say the same idea without necessarily quoting the words verbatim as they are. Now, with the software, yes, you are right. The turn it in software will pick it up as plagiarism. Ideally, uh, uh, the, the, the software has settings at the start there where you can tell it the number of words that it can accept in certain quotations or the number of um, permissible words that it can accept as direct quotations taken from everywhere. I mean, the, 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 and, and I apologize, I'm about to let a student secret out right now. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I discovered something my students had done because um, the software was not picking up the, the, the direct quotations because they were in quotes, so they were attributed to a source and there was a reference. So what students would do is that they, the font color is black. Students would go and change the font color to make it white and put something in quotation. 
And so the whole document would have these pockets, which are in white. And so what I do nowadays before I even read the document, press control A, change the fonts to black, because these, these are just emerging patterns that are happening of trying to cheat the system. The first and most important thing that we now need to do, important, especially at the first year, is try to develop academic literacies. Make sure that we are training students on how to write from such a foundational early stage so that they don't get overwhelmed when they're about to make transition from third year to honors. And all these starts with the first point that we mentioned, go and read the style guide. The style guide will try and tell you where you should focus on and where you, you how, how you should uh, approach the academic writing project. The second question is an interesting question. Um, now you mentioned the DHET list here in South Africa. We've got a list of accredited journals that we are encouraged to publish in because these journals have been through scrutiny and it's a whole uh, uh, Excel document with different tabs which I can send to anyone who wants it. Uh, that tells us where you know we can publish. But it doesn't necessarily mean just because the journal is on that list. Um, it, it, it doesn't show predatory, uh, it, it should not be cautioned in terms of its approach to predatory publishing. A latest technique that I'm noticing with certain journals that are on the list is that you write your article and then the editor of that journal writes to you and says to you, thank you for writing your article, you will be uh, now told to make revisions. As you make your revisions, make sure you cite the following six papers. And then when you cite the following six papers, you notice all the six papers belong to that editor who's telling you that your article is, has been called for revision. And for me, that, that's another form of dishonesty because if you're citing six of their papers, you're basically improving the impact factor or the, 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 the impact rating of that uh, particular uh, editor or that author's uh, writing. Uh, because they are always being cited more and more. There are things like quick turnaround, you saw to say we'll, we'll review your work and give you a response in 15 days. Um, there are things sometimes when journals don't do the hard work of um, allocating the correct editors or the correct reviewers to uh, areas of interest. So if I get an article right now on financial management, in small businesses or in multinational corporations. But just because I'm a professor within the Department of Business Management, it doesn't mean that that is my area of expertise. So what I end up doing is that I end up being given papers that we are not qualified to offer opinion in, but just for the sake of expedience in terms of publishing. And maybe uh, to those who can attend that workshop tomorrow, I, I would also recommend that you you, you download the latest uh, research done by Johan Morton on the area of uh, predatory publishing. Very insightful, and it will also help um, uh, in, in, in this regard. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else there. There's a question that please could you type your, your email address. I'm putting my email address in the chat box to those who don't have it. I think, Sibenati, I think I saw your hand up. Do you still want to have a go at it, Sipenati? Hello, Prof. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, no, I just wanted to thank you so much, but I also returned uh, on the text box uh, because the presentation uh, was indeed informative and helpful to us as we are looking forward uh, to be uh, academic right much. Please keep us posted when uh, those Noted and, and, and thanks to Penad. I think somebody wrote something like, how do you deal with rejection? Um, how do you handle rejection? One of my paper has been rejected. I will tell you, in the 10 years I've been in academia so far, uh, and the 84 papers that I've got, I still get a rejection uh, every time I attempt writing. So I think let's normalize. Let's normalize the idea of knowing that rejection is a part of the experience that we will go through in the work that we do as academics. Not just rejection of papers, 
But sometimes rejection comes in, you send your thesis, your master's thesis, or your PhD thesis, and it comes back with huge changes. I, when I got my PhD visa, when I defended my, my PhD, um, and then I had to make changes. Uh, initially, I thought I was just going to take a month to make those changes. I ended up taking six months to make the changes. So we must normalize the idea that because of the subjective nature of writing, it's not always going to be perfect, set in stone, and you know, wonderfully done. The second point that we must emphasize is the idea that um, when you get a rejection, always make sure that there is something that you can learn from that rejection. I don't like these rejections where you never get rejected and you don't get told why you were rejected. Now, I won't mention the name of a journal, but because I've published in some of these journals, I know there is a colleague who, in another institution, who may not have uh, been favorable to certain authors who were on a paper that we were writing, and our paper got rejected, but they never gave us a reason to reject that paper. And then when we took that paper, we still worked on it with no, no, no comments whatsoever. That paper got published in an international journal, which is way better than the journal that we wanted to publish in. So, so sometimes the, the so-called process of blind review is not as blind as we think it is, that there are things like this happen. Sometimes you're writing a paper on apartheid, and somebody who reviews your paper is an apartheid denialist. So those subjectivities also impede in reviewers are also human beings. So learn from the rejection, use the process of rejection to be able to um, um, uh, familiarize yourself with the range of uh, comments that are there. And all those comments can only make your paper better. Somebody asked how important um, the AB, AB, ADBC list of journals. Um, I'm not aware of that list of journals, but um, um, I, I can I can uh, find out more about what's there. Uh, and then, uh, is this the Australian Dean's uh, list of journals? Eh? Something like that. But I can I can find out and have a response. I, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not answer that now until I am double sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments, and then we can uh, safely close for the night. Okay, I, oh, there's a hand, uh, Bongeka. Oh, thank you. Uh, you. You were explaining something related to Quilly board, but I didn't get you correctly. Can you, can you revisit that explanation? Uh, related to, uh, 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 just say which, which board, which, just, just repeat, uh, related to. You were talking about to Quilly board and plagiarism, but I didn't get you correctly what you were saying. Well, there was a question by Dr. Maronga, Maronga. related to students and- uh, Oh, okay. Uh, so, so, so what I was just saying is, is that um, there are a range of ways that students are figuring out to cheat the system in terms of uh, plagiarism. Uh, I think also, let's also, uh, note that sometimes as, as, as supervisors, we must also not be hard and fast on certain aspects. So sometimes turn it in comes up and it says the word table of contents has been plagiarized. I mean, that for me is a, is a non-starter. There are certain words which are key in the field, but sometimes students have figured ways in which they cheat the system through um, changing font color, uh, but the important thing that we need is, is if we could introduce writing at such a young age, um, a first year level students writing and submitting stuff through it in to get feedback, it would actually be, be ideal. So the point really was to say, catch them young, but also make sure that as you catch them young, you are catching them young and getting them to develop key academic literacies that are related to developing their, their writing skills. Thank you so much.
Okay, not a problem. Colleagues, I want to thank you for attending. And um, basically every month I try to have some form of uh, public workshop where we can just uh, sit and um, yes, the slides will be emailed. Just drop me an email. I'll be able to send you the slides, including the link for the, for the video. My email is in the chat box. Um, and also, yeah, to keep you posted on the range of um, workshops that that happen to just help us to improve in whatever academic project that we we are working on please take care and uh, stay safe and uh, thank you for attending